Hello everyone and welcome back to our course, our course on commercial open source startups. This is the fourth and last part of the section on software industry, on the software industry. And previously we discussed what software products are, how they are provided by software vendors. Now I want to talk about the underlying business models and I will do so in general terms. And then in the second part to follow after this initial part, we will look at specifically commercial open source business models. For that, however, we need to understand what makes a business tick, the so-called business model. We previously discussed business functions and business processes. Now we will put it together under one strong conceptual model. That model that I'm using has been provided by this book, Business Model Generation, and it comes in the form of the business model a canvas, a visualization tool. So uh, a business model is a model, a description of how an organization creates, delivers and captures value. Uh, that's of course business speak. Value ultimately means something that's useful and valuable. Often it translates into money. And then a business model is the organization and its processes in how it creates the value, builds a product delivers a, a value, gets the product to customers and captures value, actually makes money off it. So a model is a generic description and it gets instantiated, meaning it gets executed uh, over and over again. So there are, first of all, uh, one company has a business model. Let's assume they have one business model. And as they operate it, they cookie cutter style, apply it over and over again. You can also abstract from it and look at similar companies and see a more abstract pattern of an underlying business model that's common to it, which is exactly what we will do in later, uh, later lectures when we talk about commercial open source. So a business model is that description, a model of the interactions of components and the relationships of how an organization creates, delivers and captures value. As mentioned, uh, we're using the book Business Model Generation to talk about business models. It gives us the vocabulary and in particular, it gives us this visualization of a business model, the so-called business model canvas. What you can see here is the original business model canvas in the middle and then some enhancements by me. The original business model canvas consists of these nine sections that are tiles here. On the left, key partners, key activities and key resources. Then centered the value proposition and then customer relationships, channels and customer segments as well when both of it is supported by cost structure and revenue streams. These nine sections are the original sections of the business model canvas. Arguably, these are the pieces, or components, course components that you need to understand about a business to get a handle on its uh, business model and then the interaction of these components as specified for a given company constitute the business model. I have colored them here in a specific way relating to the homework. So three sections each in a different color as they relate to the three people in a team. What I find noteworthy is that to the left, there is the value creation. How do you actually create the product? How do you manufacture it? How do you develop the software, etc.? And to the right is the value capture, which is how do you get it to customers and make money off it? And consequently, that's also nicely mapped by the cost structure for building the product and the revenue streams for making money of a product. And the center, of course, is perhaps the most important part, though all of the parts are important. This in the center is the value proposition, which bridges from value creation to value capture. And hence, uh, this is how I structure the discussion or explanation of the business model canvas and possible business models underlying it. 
first front and center what is a value proposition and then uh, value capture and value creation. So let's get started. Value proposition, nice business term. That's why customers buy. They see some value. It's such a generic word, value, because it varies so widely what it is that customers want. In these most abstract terms, it's a gain customers want to achieve or a pain that's taken away from them. That's why they buy. That's the value. Solving a problem or fulfilling a need. And in order to create that value for your customers, you need a product or service that uh, delivers exactly that, that value to customers. Uh, that product or service, in the case of a startup, can start out with a so-called minimum viable product, the smallest possible product that helps achieve that pain or gain, uh, pain relief or gain creation. Uh, and of course, that's what product management has to define the ultimate, ultimately the value proposition. The value proposition, the value can be vastly different. Um, categorizing, it could be quantitative. Are you able to do something faster I, uh, with your product? I, is your product cheaper than the alternatives? It could also be qualitative. Is it really novel? Does it help the customer break new grounds because your software lets them do something they couldn't do before and so forth? Here are some examples um, of uh, or a common model of how people look at the value proposition. Again, it's the pains you relieve or the gains you enable for them. And there could be either problems or needs that you solve. Uh, I find it, find it somewhat hard to classify, even though it's recognizably different parts. Let's use an example. Uh, let's let's use the example of um, you are receiving products from a supplier and there's a contract which says so and so, this and this should be in the box and uh, you need to check that your delivery that the delivery you get is correct so pain is looking at all of this um, by hand using printouts and then looking at the products in the crate, for example, and that can be laborious and that can be error prone. Again, could be that you fast, more faster recognize uh, that there's something amiss and makes it easier, automates away checking, uh, say, the manifest of something that's coming in with what's supposed to be in there. So these are things of how you relieve a pain or create a gain. And in this example, uh, the actual value, ultimately, the price you can charge customers strongly depends on that, is uh, how, how relevant are the in incidents. If something is missing and it's an expensive product, then it's very relevant. If something's not in the crate that should be there, but that is super expensive, then it's obviously highly relevant. If it's smaller stuff, Maybe it's the frequency. How often is something wrong with a shipment to you? So you can quantify by the significance, uh, the relevance of a problem or a gain, and you can quantify by how often does it take place. And of course, the ultimate value is the product uh, of both the relevance or significance times the frequency of how often it happens. So let's assume you have a value proposition or a company has a value proposition. The question is, does it actually make money off it? That's not a given. Um, economists talk about the value creation being separate from the value capture. Um, for example, open source programmers create a lot of value with their open source components. But because they make it available for free, they do not capture generally, usually any of the value. Other people, who other people who commercialize it may capture some of the value, but not the original open source programmers if they do it as a free service. So value capture, sometimes also called value appropriation, is something to look at and watch out for, and it's encoded in the business model canvas in the sections uh, to the right. So value capture is the comprehensive process of 
creating revenue, deriving a revenue stream uh, from customers in market segments. So we need to understand that there are large markets and they can be broken down into segments and that actually the value proposition can vary by segment. So deriving revenues from customers in market segments uh, by delivering to them uh, that value proposition so that they pay you and you deliver to them through a channel and you can only do that because you previously sold to them and maintain that customer relationship with them. So revenue streams, customer segments, channels and customer relationships that are the sections of the value capture side plus the integrating value proposition. And these four or five parameters, each one complex and possibly unique in their own right, this creates the value capture side of a business model. So let's look at that. Let's look at these tiles. Let's look at these components of a business plan in more detail. Customers, they are classified or categorized into market segments. You have an overall market, uh, computers, and then you have market segments like laptops versus servers versus uh, mobile devices. And within those segments, you have sub-segments, etc. What's common is that you see some cohesiveness in the customers you put into these segments. And the idea, of course, is that all those customers which you categorize into the same cluster, into the same market segment, can be satisfied by the same or a similar value proposition. And hence your product manager focuses on what's common to these customers in that segment in order to guide product development and make your value proposition match their the customer needs. Uh, the segments or the markets you sell to can get complicated because, for example, you can have multiple very different segments and multi-sided markets like on an auction place like eBay, you have buyers and sellers and they have very different needs and you monetize them in different ways. Taken together, however, that is the total market uh, you're, you're selling to. So all the similar segments, all the variations taken together form the total market. And then again, your value proposition in general. So your general value proposition needs to match the overall market and then uh, specific focus points or specific variations or specializations of the value proposition need to match the various market segments. Um, we haven't done that yet, but we will fill in the business model canvas. We will fill in each tile with what we think are the market segments, so again, laptops or mobile devices or server computers. And as we do so, we will quickly fill up the canvas. So what we often do is we take a copy of the canvas and where it says customer segments, we really just have one segment and then we have multiple instances of the business model canvas, each one for a different customer segment. Mm -hmm. That also means that then the rest of the business model canvas is focused on how is that value proposition created and how is it delivered to that particular segment and what are the specific revenue streams and cost structures we derive from that. So we basically duplicate or using the model, the business model canvas as a template, uh, generate a business model specific to the segment, and then you have multiple business model canvases for your total market. As you look at your customer segments, um, one way of doing so is to look at them uh, by their needs, and the needs may vary by the involved people, because ultimately it's people needs you satisfy. And this is the realm of personas. Uh, it doesn't make sense to talk about Joe or Jane at a particular customer company. You want to abstract from that. And uh, so you have typically, so you use personas as some kind of archetypical description of a person you might find in all the companies in your market segment you're looking at. And uh, in a somewhat generic version, 
as probably an end user if you're selling a software. But that's by far not the only persona to consider as you're building a product and selling it in a bit, because an end user has an end user has a manager who may have some needs. Uh, if it's software you're selling, there's usually an IT department which has needs and even there's even less visible to the beginners, but clearly there something called the economic buyer, a person who holds the purse strings, you know, who needs to sign for the money to be spent on your product. Now you will have much more specialized personas when you look at the end user, there's the older person or the younger person or the specialized for this and the specialist for that. But uh, in general, I'm using this very basic pattern of end user, the manager, the IT department and the economic buyer to explain um, how to deliver, relate a value proposition to customers in a market segment. Um, customers, the people who ultimately pay, uh, could be the same. So these personas ultimately could also be viewed as roles. And in some cases, it's all the same person. In which case, well, consumers. Yeah? So if you buy that computer game for home, you're probably the person who is the user, who also pays for it, who is the operator, the IT department of your own, puts it on your gaming machine or something. Now, in a full-blown uh, situation of some enterprise software, then the uh, customer is the company, of course, but the end user is different from the economic buyer, is different from the IT department, is different from the end user's manager. So most enterprise software is like that because it's not a single person. Uh, it's a large company usually or sometimes of many different people who then pick up these roles and from the product manager's perspective are personas to deal with. With two-sided markets, sometimes there's a clear split. It's uh, very different uh, to look at the uh, user uh, versus the customer. So social media, for example, sells advertising to companies. So there is an end user there and there is an um, economic buyer. But uh, then there's a separate type of user, which uh, sometimes is called the product, meaning your attention. Uh, that is being sold for marketing purposes to the, to the um, actual customers of the social media company. So you need to look at your um, markets, uh, your market or markets in, uh, in a structured way, as already indicated. Possibly use multiple instances of the business model canvas by market segment. Here's a way to, to look at your markets. So there is the overall market of cars you might be selling. And you have these different uh, um, uh, in two-sided or multi-sided markets, which they quickly become. You have very different customer types, so the car buyers, car sellers, the dealerships, etc. You can then split the markets into uh, by product into uh, different segments because by product, Customers have different needs. So there are the trucks, and hence there are truck buyers and sellers, dealerships, minivans, sport cars, etc. And within that scenario, within each market segment, again, then you have personas. So you have the user who may also be the buyer of a truck, doesn't have to be uh, the economic buyer because. Uh, companies buy cars to have a fleet of cars they operate and so there could be all kinds of variations in these personas and how they correlate. So you need to think through, you're specific for a particular business model, you need to think through your market, how it's, what's the classification of that market, one-sided, two-sided, multi-sided, the different segments by product and then the personas within each segment as you try to understand your customers and map, map again that value proposition to them. So you have a value proposition sometimes split by different market segments and products. Now how do you get uh, that 
value to your customers and ultimately capture it. Well, you get your products to customers through channels. Um, you just don't put your product out on the curb side of the street and it gets picked up. No, you need to market it and you need to deliver it. So there are all kinds of channels with different stages of your customer relationship from again marketing to actual physical or digital uh, delivery. So that happens through a channel which connects you, the vendor, with your customers. Uh, there's so much variation there, but to give you a rough idea, of course, the product, depending on whether it's physical or digital, uh, can be delivered in different ways and the channels can be physical and digital again as well. So, for example, physical delivery of a physical product that would be food in a supermarket, but digital delivery of uh, using a digital channel would be downloading software from the web. And that's pretty common. You have the other forms too. Physical books can still be bought, um, uh, but um, they might be now on a Kindle, so effectively also becoming a digital product. Yeah, so common distribution channels are your own web store. Going back to, to uh, software, your own web store or a app store for others where you are the platform provider. Uh, there are digital retailers who take your software and get it to customers. You're not even distributing it yourself any longer. There are still for the physical world, bookstores, electronics stores, um, as well as system integrators doing the job for you. Sometimes channels are direct and sometimes they're indirect. That is a key distinction and an important part of business models these days. Are you selling direct to consumers or do you have intermediaries? So direct to consumers, most notably, is a recent trend where companies who provide a product also pick up the logistics of delivery, so all the marketing, but also the logistics of delivering it to customers because, well, they cut off the intermediary and make more profit, but they have the extra hassle of the logistics, which means, of course, that logistics are a pain for if you want to be a direct-to-consumer business. So someone can solve that problem for you without actually dealing with your product. So that's why we have all the logistics startups these days. Or it's an indirect uh, channel sale uh, where you have resellers. So all the electronic markets chains, chains uh, Saturn or Best Buy, they are effectively some sort of intermediary and they take a cut. So your profit drops if you have to rely on those intermediaries um, uh, to get your product sold to customers. On the other hand, you can focus on perhaps your strength, which would, which would be building that product. Your customer relationships is exactly that, whether there's an intermediary or not. It's how you acquire customers and get customers, how you keep them, and how you possibly maximize the revenue you make of them or how you grow uh, what you get out of them. And we discussed some of that selling by looking already by how you should look at personas as a way of understanding your customers and then you custom tailor your product to fulfill the needs of these personas and that will already be very helpful for your salespeople, sales reps to match and argue why your product is say, superior because it fulfills the customer needs so well. Now, getting customers, customer acquisition is a very structured, possibly very quantitative process. Uh, some people say it's an art but others disagree. It is a highly scientific, quantitatively manageable process. And the model for that process, which I mentioned in previous lectures, is the sales funnel. The sales funnel is a stage-based process where other companies or other legal entities, including consumers, go through a process of increasing engagement with you, the vendors, until at the end they buy your product, if they buy. And so it's got these stages of increasing engagement 
and each stage some people or some legal entities companies enterprises or consumers drop out as they are less interested but those that survive move on to the next stage and eventually become customers these stages have names there are many variants of the sales funnel and ultimately it is specific to your business but here i'm just using for illustration purposes five stages the initial awareness of your product some of Potential customers don't even know your product exists. They are not going to buy. So you need to raise awareness. That's marketing. Then you need to uh, get a handle on them. You need to get an email address. You get need to get the name. So um, in marketing speak, you turn them into a qualified lead because you talked to them at a fair and they gave you your business card or they came to your website and they entered their contact data that they wanted to learn more about your product. So after awareness comes you, the vendor, identifying those who came as possibly qualified lead. You get some blip, some signal they might be interested. That's then usually when sales takes over and sales tries to get the, we'll be talking to the identified qualified lead now, and will get them to take a closer look at your product. In some form or another, uh, your salespeople will get them to evaluate your product and whether it fits their needs. Uh, such evaluation can be a high cost, high profile, prototypical instantiation with the customer, or it could be just reading some slides and deciding that's good enough for some marketing collateral and that's good enough for your for the customer needs all of that is possible from the low key low touch to the high touch sales now then if customers actually recognize the value that you are proposing to them so they pass through the evaluation stage successfully uh, they have an intent to buy probably by now uh, possible competitors have been left left in the dust and now the customer wants to the potential customer wants to buy but they are still a potential customer because they we still need to agree on a price that maybe your product is too expensive so there is the intent stage and it can still fail but of course if there's a successful negotiation in the case of a high touch sales situation or the price is just right in the case of a low touch sales situation then they will buy hence there are these five stages of shuttling potential customers identifying them so raising awareness identifying them helping them evaluate your product getting them to buy in the end that uh, the customers pro go through and it's a highly qualitative uh, process because at every stage some people will drop out and if you're trying to scale your business you'll get large enough numbers to know what percentage should drop out and um, and uh, hence you can manage that and you can see which sales people are performing well and which sales people are not doing so well also each step in the sales funnel has a potential cost that comes with it after all you're spending money on marketing you're spending money on salespeople, possibly traveling around to customer sites and so forth all of that is accumulated in the so and put together as the so-called customer acquisition cost a key metric of any software business because if it costs you more to get a customer than you make of your product, then you have a real uh, problem. So uh, as you think through business uh, models, you need to think through how much it will cost you to get customers and how that will be compensated by, uh, by the revenues you generate off them. So that's what I meant by all of this can be and should be very quantitative. I can only illustrate some aspects. So here is, for example, a very simplified uh, customer acquisition cost for an enterprise software product. Um, along the sales funnel, which I have simplified here into three stages, uh, you have costs by the people, by the things they have to do. And you can sum it up and you need to align it with all the people who drop out. So there's marketing 
getting a lead at a trade show. Each lead costs 100 euro in this example, and that's what you start out with, so it's 100% survival rate. So let's assume, not a lot, but let's assume you only got 10 customers, uh, 10 interested parties, not yet customers, so qualified leads, 10 qualified leads, and the cost per lead was 100 euro, so that whole trade show uh, or that whole stage cost you 1,000 euro. Now, all 10 uh, uh, you talk to, but um, uh, you then go into an evaluation, you talk with them, and um, each one that makes it through the evaluation stage costs you 5,000 euro, because that's uh, over the total number of people who get there, that's uh, what the cost is, so that's 10,000 euro then. And then, uh, and, but you only have two remaining of the 10, eight dropped out uh, during the evaluation. And then you actually have the sales negotiation and for one customer it's too much and for the other it's, uh, it's not. And so you have one buying customer. That's how you often calculate it backwards. You start with one customer at the end, how many trade show leads or how many qualified leads did you need in the beginning? And so you have, have the cost for that um, for that sale at 2,000 euro here. So then, in order to generate that one sale, you had all the costs that came before it, inc including the money you spent on interested parties, qualified leads who did not become customers. So the cost of acquiring that one customer out of the initial qualified leads is 13,000 euro in this simplifying example. And this is how you calculate backwards. One customer is left over, that's what you want, but you need to talk to all these others, so 13,000 euro in this case. Now, if you know that you can satisfy two customers, 10 customers, 100 customers, then you know how much you need to put money in, get to work on the early stages of the sales funnel, because you know that out of 10, only one will survive. And if you think you're ready with your product and you want 100 customers, then you need uh, to generate uh, uh, then you need to generate a thousand trade a thousand qualified leads. So you calculate it backwards from that, and that of course drives your uh, the customer acquisition cost is the same, but the total amount of customers, so the individual customer acquisition cost is the same, but the total acquisition costs of the customers then goes up, of course. Now, customer acquisition is the critical part, getting the customer. You also want to keep them. You want to keep them because keeping them takes much less effort than getting new ones. So retaining existing customers is, rule of thumb, uh, five to ten times cheaper than acquiring new ones. So you absolutely should also look at retaining customers, making them happy and you have five to ten times more a bang of the buck, uh, in particular in the subscription world where there is no revenue difference between new and existing uh, customers. How do you keep them? Uh, well, what do you do for that? Uh, well, first of all, of course, your product needs to remain uh, uh, a good product. Uh, but there are many other techniques. Have a loyalty program, give them benefits, talk to the individual people making decisions and make them feel at home and valued by you. Um, and also, well, you can try to lock them in. Uh, locking them in is not necessarily um, uh, a great strategy because people can get very upset if uh, they see that in advance and not become customers in the first place. But if they are customers and you lock them in, uh, then uh, that will increase their switching costs, makes it more expensive for them to go elsewhere. And then if they're rational decision makers and not just highly annoyed, that's what they, uh, that, uh, then they will stick with you. An example of that in the cloud world is the significant egress fees uh, that Amazon charges you. You would think Amazon Web Service charges you. You would think taking your, money, uh, taking your data and going to a competitor uh, would be free, but it's not. 
downloading all your data is highly expensive. That's the egress fees that AWS puts on you, locking in you, locking you into AWS services. And it recently became a point of attack by newcomers in the space. Cloudflare provides, uh, wants to be, that's at least my interpretation, some sort of hyperscaler eventually and promises zero egress, fee, egress fees. Cloudflare will not try to lock you in should you be dissatisfied. Moving to a competitor should have lower total cost and in particular zero egress fees of taking your data out. So how do you look at that? Uh, you want to keep them. The key measure here is you want to keep your customers. The key measure is the so-called customer churn. How many, what percentage of your customers do you lose in a given time period? You can't help it. You will lose people or you will lose customers. So you're not happy and you want to keep the number no, low because again, retention is so much easier than getting acquiring new customers. But how do you do it? Well, before that, well, so you do it by the techniques just mentioned, but you can also look at it statistically. If you lose so and so many customers over a particular period of time, you need to acquire new customers in order to keep a steady state, or you need to acquire more customers than you thought you have to acquire to keep growing because, well, you also lose some customers. So here's an example. If you have 20% monthly churn and you start with 100 customers, then after one month you have 80 left. That's a very high churn. I hope nobody will have that high churn. 5% is more common. 1% is good in the industry. Depends on the business, obviously. So if you have a 5% monthly churn after one month and you start with 100, you have 95. You can see how the numbers dwindle. 5% churn after a year means you lost half a monthly churn, um, means you lost half your, your customer. So 5% monthly is not a good churn. 5% annually is a reasonable churn. And 1% annually is a great churn. So um, in most, most businesses. So that is churn. And you also often use uh, a different a value the average customer lifetime, meaning how long does the average customer stay with you? So that's the inverse of churn. So um, a monthly 1% churn rate means uh, 100 months of customer lifetime. That customer will be, will be with you. The average customer will be with you uh, uh, for 100 months, meaning for 100 months you get their revenue. So you can calculate how much money you make of the average customer. And then you now have a measure for how much customer acquisition can cost you. Certainly not more than the lifetime value, the money you make of a customer over its lifetime. So you can correlate average customer acquisition and average lifetime value to see whether someone's valuable. I'll come to that in a few slides. So, um, uh, Retaining customers is cheaper than acquiring new customers and upselling or making more money of existing customers is also cheaper than acquiring new customers. So you should not neglect your existing customers, not just to keep them, but also to sell them more in reasonable ways. Uh, selling them more is called upselling or cross-selling or getting referrals. So upselling means um, for a given product, you say sell them more modules. Maybe there's the higher end version of your product or that additional functionality that they don't have yet, but that you price separately. So that would be an upsell from a lower priced product to the higher priced version of the product. You could cross sell them. If you have multiple products uh, and they are happy with you, you sell them the other products. If you, uh, customers are using Microsoft Word, you cross sell them to using Microsoft Excel if they don't already have it. And of course, you can use customers who talk to each other, organize in the industry. You talk to them and get referrals and get existing customers to uh, talk well of you and so forth. And that's how that's actually getting new customers. 
So I said or shortly pointed at uh, customer churn and then the inverse, uh, customer lifetime. The critical metric is after lifetime, the actual value you get out of it, the total gross profits uh, from the customer or in today's currency. So I did this not precisely a few seconds ago. Here it's the gross profits, meaning the uh, revenues minus uh, the minus uh, the cost of, uh, of acquiring that customer. I'm using gross profits here. Sometimes it's just the revenues. So the point is if the gross profits are zero uh, or are negative, then it's not worth acquiring the customers because they cost you more than you make money of them. So absolutely you need to calculate that. Look at how much it costs you to uh, acquire customers. Look how much money revenues you get off them and uh, determine the, as the difference the total lifetime value of a customer from that and you have a business if it's positive and usually significantly uh, positive because if it's near zero there will be other costs that bring you down. Um, so here the uh, um, uh, costs are really the uh, costs of goods sold, the actual provision of the product and not your, your fixed cost to which I'll look in a second as well. So um, really your customer lifetime value, uh, um, if it's counted as revenue, should be much larger than your customer acquisition cost, which is a different way of saying it really uh, should, be, uh, should be, the gross profits should be much larger than zero. And at the bottom of the business model canvas, you see the revenue streams. So that of course plays into customer lifetime value here. And the revenue is the money you make off your products and you need to make it, otherwise you have no business. So revenue by definition is the income you get from a customer, effectively the payments. Uh, it's an income statement term, so it's accumulated. Um, it does break down into the actual cash flow but uh, it's uh, uh, on an accounting level, so it doesn't count. It's not relevant when the actual money flows in the accounts, but rather it's when you book it in your accounts. Um, that's revenue. Revenue source is sometimes a synonym for customer, sometimes for the product. Well, it's what generates the, uh, the um, revenue. It's a bit loose in the terminology of the industry. Revenue stream is the uh, revenues over time um, and the aggregate revenue streams is when you aggregate that over different products or different market segments depending on your analysis uh, need and if only the final income statement and then the total is all the revenues you use business intelligence software to look at this in detail and manage your product now revenues result from getting money from customers, which means you need to put a price on a product, more specifically a price on a unit of your product and service and its different aspects. Uh, I think we talked about some of that pricing strategies in the past. Let's look at it a little bit more in detail. Um, First of all, usually the customer wants to get a price list and depending on the complexity of the product may try to negotiate uh, for it. Um, the key parameters are of course what's the unit here and what's the individual price of a unit because the number of units times the price is the money you make uh, as the vendor selling uh, the product. It would be wonderful for the software vendor if they um, understood the value that their product creates for the customer and then could uh, turn that into uh, a euro sign or into euros and ask exactly for that money. That is so-called value-based pricing. You try to understand the value and that's exactly what you price your customers because that's what it's worth to them and that's what you would try to uh, what you would try to um, get out of them. Now for that you really need to understand your customers and they would be crazy if they tell you 
about, for example, their internal return on investment uh, calculation on whether they should buy uh, this product or not. They do that during evaluation phase of the sales process. Um, they shouldn't tell you because then you know how you can increase prices possibly. Can you increase prices? Well, you have a price list, so you may feel bound by that. But the price list is often in particular the more complex and expensive a product gets is more is more um, at the higher end and everyone expects to get discounts. So what you want to do is buy customer price, uh, which you can't do easily. And it's called price discrimination, uh, not in a negative sense, simply discriminating by by potential customer. Um, but it's really hard to do. Um, but depending on how much you know, uh, you can do it. Amazon automates some of that as they show different people different prices basically for, for the same product because you don't see at the moment what, the, what other customers get shown on Amazon shopping for a price. And the fundamental here is always buy, try to price based on the value you're generating and not based on your costs. If your the value is lower than your costs, you have no business. Um, in some highly competitive commoditized businesses, the costs, you can only price by taking an average markup over the costs, uh, but that, and that is a valid pricing strategy, but it's just not a good one. You always try to price based on, on uh, value. So how much money do you make? Again, it's the number of units you sell times the price. And if you sell more units, uh, then maybe customers uh, will try to re get a reduced price, get a discount, etc. And then uh, as you have these revenue streams from the individual sales, they get aggregated again. And again, you need business intelligence tools to understand and analyze that. All right, moving on from the value capture side, how do you make money off your product to the value creation side? How do you create it in the first place? A big topic in its own. Value creation is the comprehensive process of creating your product uh, for customers and evolving it along with their needs. In traditional terms, it was producing some widget in a factory and today in software, of course, it's uh, the engineering department which develops the software, including its operations in the cloud. That is value creation, um, irrespective of how much money you make of it. Now, in the business model canvas, we have a couple of uh, tiles or sections for this. Key partners, key resources, key activities. A key partner is another organization that you have come to an agreement with on uh, on something important to your, uh, to your product and your value uh, 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 creation and delivery. So a key partner um, helps you in some form. Maybe they deliver components. They're important suppliers to you. Maybe they operate some business process for you, like they operate, uh, they give you the CRM software for your sales process, etc. These types of partnerships can be very different. I mostly mentioned just suppliers. Uh, suppliers can be commodity suppliers, then they are maybe not key. But if there's only one, then they are a key supplier, like Apple relies on Foxconn for the production of iPhones. There can be strategic alliances. So SAP needed a partner ecosystem of consulting companies to help customers get the value out of SAP business suites. So strategic alliances, strategic business partners are those that are needed to get your product to, part, to customers, get your product used at customers if you don't do it yourself and get it run running well. You can do joint business development, market development with others. Intel had this fabulous Intel Insight com campaign with Computer manufacturers, Dell and Lenovo, maybe Lenovo, I'm not sure, Dell certainly, um, uh, IBM, of course, back then. And so that is joint business development. Intel plus the laptops of these manufacturers together uh, created a better market for Intel. And sometimes you can view strategic investors as partnerships 
though be wary of the consequences of having strategic investors who might pull you into a direction that uh, you don't like. Uh, maybe if you take on a strategic investor early in a startup's career, maybe you just sold the company. What makes a good partnership uh, tick? What is a good key partner? You understand each other's value proposition and they are separate, but you both benefit. So um, if you don't understand the other, the partner's value proposition and how they tick, then uh, you probably, you might run into problems. Sometimes also companies are so different, they just can't effectively work with each other. Small chaotic startups, fast moving startups don't necessarily work well with large, slow, highly business process focused companies. And then there are key resources. So partners are other companies who do something. Key resources are assets, resources you need uh, to operate your business like access to some uh, some land or access to ultimately some particular channel access in intangibles to patents that you're allowed to use or that you own um, by category resources are materials so that's how economists define as materials capital and labor of materials that could be tangible things like raw materials uh, do you have access to uh, the special earths that uh, some companies are hugging, hogging? Uh, do you have uh, access to protection capabilities? And also the intellectual property, source code, patents, uh, even trademarks. So that would be materials. What about and then capital? Uh, if you don't have the funds to operate and pay your people, then you do not have a business either so capital is important and finally labor do you have qualified people do you have access to new skilled labor because some people will leave your company so all of these things are key resources by category and then specifically for your business you need to look at what they are um, like the raw materials like the production facilities etc you can pay for them but if they are key you want long-term contracts to lock them in because if they are key resources you don't want to lose them at the inopportune moment ip is something we need to look at we previously did some of that we will look at it again in the open source part of this course and so we have these various forms of ip and how they become a key intellect a key resource for you you invent them yourself, you build them up over time and reuse them, or it's in the relationships. So you jointly do them with universities, for example, purchase them and so forth. If you don't have access to capital, if you don't know how to tap into, uh, say, venture capital, you do have a problem. If you don't know how to talk to a bank to get, get a loan, you may have a problem. This sometimes has the weirdest sources for example access to venture capitalists is easy if you're in berlin or if you're in the silicon valley but it's much harder if you in, live in a town of uh, 60,000 uh, people so access to capital can have various factors that influence it even in this global distributed work and then how do you get access to, to skilled people both in terms of quality, how skilled are they, and quantity. Do you get enough to fulfill your growth needs, for example? So that often boils down to access to local universities, but not just that, because, well, that would be junior people, and you also need senior people. Then, beyond key resources and key partners you have to run your business processes and you need to run your business processes well there are those business processes that everyone has um, if you're a software vendor then payroll paying your people for the labor is not a competitively differentiating business process ideally you outsource it so that's not a key activity but the software development itself your um, ability to ship 
using agile software development techniques regularly at high quality even your continuous delivery pipeline these are key activities processes by humans by machines that are competitive differentiators that you need to do as well as possible and you need to have those in-house you can't outsource them unless you outsource them as a long-term locked-in contract so that it's ultimately yours and so for the software vendor it's the original development of software and the operations of the software in the cloud in our new world of cloud businesses supporting all of that the value creation is a cost structure that you need to understand because it pays for all of that production and creation and that is the final tile in the business model canvas we want to discuss so all the costs that your company has including for example customer acquisition costs but also production costs and so forth um, you can split those costs into very simple fixed and variable costs Variable costs ideally are those that correlate to revenues. So for example, the costs of goods sold or the costs of revenues, that's how much it costs you to create $1 of revenue, ideally costs you much less than $1 of uh, $1. So um, that is the variable costs and they scale up with revenues. So they should be as small as possible. If you have high fixed costs, which are the costs that are there uh, even if you had no customers then that is not an unsurmountable problem because as you grow your customers the difference between the gross profits the difference between the revenues and the cost of revenues should ultimately eventually cover the fixed cost and that's why over time you prefer to have things in fixed costs as you grow if it doesn't kill you in the beginning you can get over it by the, with the help of venture capital it's good to have things in fixed cost rather than in variable costs. So here are examples. Uh, if you're an on-premise software, well, just the software development is usually a fixed cost because um, you don't quite scale up your software development team for each new customer. If it was a consulting business, that would be different. But for a software vendor, software development is kind of uh, fixed as you don't grow your labor force so much. Customer support is much more closely correlated with, uh, with um, uh, revenues. As for each new customer, you have some more support that you might need, even though it's also not a perfect example of variable costs. If you run the software as a service, then fixed costs are the uh, site reliability engineering things of site, some of the software development specifically aimed at the as a service component as opposed to the actual business functionality and the variable costs are obviously the increased computing power that you need as you onboard a new customer so that's why it's variable a new customer a bit more strain on your resources meaning you need to buy more resources so um, coming uh, to an end here there are different types of businesses obviously by industry but there are many different ways of slicing and dicing uh, different businesses and ultimately different business models it's a famous uh, paper making which gave us this uh, matrix here you could be a leader in product innovation you could be a leader in a cozy really nice customer relationship where you manage that well and you could be those maintaining and operating uh, capital intensive to establish infrastructure uh, and that means there are high barriers to entry so a product leader would be um, apple for example on its many innovative products uh, customer relationship management would be uh, someone who really focuses on the customer on the customer experience maybe some of the airlines do that well, though some certainly don't. And infrastructure management companies, well, that's the uh, um, Vodafones or uh, fiber companies uh, that give us internet and so forth. And then they can vary by, uh, 
by their economics, their culture, and where they compete uh, with, with the others. Uh, this is more an economic, would, this discussing this in more detail would be more of an economics lecture, so let me stop here. We talked about what a business model is and described the most common these days way of capturing uh, a business model in the form of the business model canvas. The advantage now is everyone knows it, everyone has an understanding of what the tiles mean and they are somewhat sufficient to discuss the business model. So it gives us a, gave us a language to talk about business models. Uh, this business model canvas at the center has the value proposition, which is created on the one side through a set of activities and resources and partners. And on the other hand, uh, the vendor captures the value they create uh, using channels, customer relationships as they sell into various markets. All of that is supported by a cost structure on the creation and sales side and a revenue uh, created on the capture side. With that, thank you very much for your time and attention. This was the fourth of four uh, lectures in the first part of three in this course about the software industry. Next up will be open source and commercial open source business models. See you then.